Mike was a deeply compassionate soul. And it's an odd juxtaposition with the sort of wildness and primalness of him, but he definitely had that. I mean, those of you who've been to his place have seen all his plants that he cared for uh, with such great love, all those, these epiphytes and rare cacti and everything. Um, you know of his love for his odd-looking hairless dog named Puppy. Um, but I wanted to share a very quick little anecdote that illustrates this point. He and I were, and I, I don't know, is Joe Cernich here too? I don't think Joe is here. We were in Kenya, we were in Nairobi waiting to go up into the wilds of Kenya near Lake Turkana, along the shores of Lake Turkana, but we were staying in a nice hotel. And we were up one morning and there was a buffet-style breakfast, and we were sitting there having breakfast, and Mike was sitting across from me and we were talking, and all of a sudden Mike looked distracted, and he got up quickly and he walked off, and I turned around, and he walked up to this, this man, a guest, who was talking to this um, Kenyan woman who was serving breakfast, omelets or something. And the man was angry with the woman. And Mike just walks up and he says, is there a problem? <laughs> and the guy, thinking that he had a kindred spirit in Mike, said, yeah, this woman, I'm just trying to get my breakfast and she messed up the eggs and I can't, she can't get anything right. I can't believe this. And Mike waited for the guy to finish and he said, okay, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to apologize to this woman and you're going to walk away. <laughs> And the man did. And <laughs> Mike had this fierceness about him that you just wouldn't want to mess with. But he knew that this woman couldn't speak up for herself. And in fact, she cried. And she thanked him. And she said, I am so sorry that I couldn't do anything. But if I said anything, I would have lost my job. And Mike didn't even blink. Didn't make a big deal of it. Wasn't into the whole hero thing. He just came right back, sat down, had his breakfast. And it just speaks to his sense of justice that he had. It was really deep in him, and that sense of compassion. So, just to wrap up then, what are sort of three things that Mike leaves behind? What legacies? The first one, the obvious one, of course, are all the fossils. I have no clue how many tons, how many thousands of fossils, you know, hundreds of tons, probably, of fossils. Alan Titus could probably come up with a better estimate than I could offhand, but but many, many fossils. And those fossils, especially from Grand Staircase, remember, when we went down there, there were only microfossils that had really been excavated. And in that course of 18 years, Grand Staircase has arguably become certainly one of the best, if not the best, known ecosystem from the entire Mesozoic era anywhere on Earth. Plants, microfossils. Fishes, turtles, lizards, mammals, dinosaurs, crocodiles, pterosaurs, all these things. And a huge part of that is because of Mike. You know, I may have been here and doing a lot of the research stuff, and Randy Ermis has been ably doing this since my departure, but it was Mike who was the force behind getting those things out of the ground and being, us being able to tell this amazing story. And today, Grand Staircase is threatened. And Mike would want me to say something about that, too. Um, the federal government is talking, in fact, they're planning now to redraw the boundaries of Grand Staircase. And the Kaparowitz, which is the area where nine, well, the Kaparowitz Plateau is where virtually all of these fossils come from, is now threatened with mining. And uh, we may lose a big chunk of that. And that is a tragedy, because that place is one of the great treasure troves on Earth for fossils and deserves to be protected. So that's one legacy. The second one is all the paleontologists might train. How to find, how to dig up, how to prepare fossils. I was with Mark Lowen last night and Mark made a statement and it took me aback and then I said, you know, you're right. Mark said, I'm pretty sure that Mike has trained more people how to do pale field paleontology and lab prep than anybody else on Earth. And that may be a true statement. That speaks because he's the volunteer program here is huge and thriving, and it's even larger a po a program in Denver. And Mike headed those programs for a number of years and you know taught all these folks and got them engaged. So think about that. Not just volunteers, but 
all the graduate students, the postdocs, the other researchers that came out, the impact that Mike has had on paleontology will last for generations to come. And that is a true legacy. And then finally, the third legacy, I would say, is represented by all the people in this room and many, many others beyond the walls of this museum. Um, that intensity and passion and drive that Mike had is affected all of us, I'm sure, one way or another. And we will all carry that forward. Um, I don't know who it was, somewhere on social media said that Mike did more living in half a lifetime than most people do in one lifetime, and I cannot argue that. He was a phenomenal guy, and I feel honored to have known him. So um, I want to thank you all for coming out today to honor Mike, and, and it's my privilege to be able to be here and speak with you. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.